Okay, so you guys can see this slide bit. Okay. Looks good. Okay, so today we're just going to go over uh, using R to do statistics. So um, we're going to do some basic statistics uh, functions, so correlation, t test, linear regression, and logistic regression. But just as a warning, we're only going to teach the software of how to do these things. And we're not going to actually teach the theory or any of the assumptions you need. So you'll have to learn that from somewhere else. So maybe an online Coursera class or something, or there's the 620 series at the school. So uh, use this stuff at your own uh, risk, basically. OK, so getting into correlation. Just as a reminder, correlation is sort of how you can compare two variables to see if they have a linear relationship. So if they do, it at maximum could be one, minimum negative one, depending if it's a line that goes uh, positively or negatively, and zero would mean that there's no relationship at all. So here we have the function in our COR to get the correlation. And if you're just looking at the correlation between two variables, you could use uh, x and y, which are inputs for numeric vectors, and then that would give you the correlation just between them. Or if you want to get the correlation between a lot of things at once, you could just use x and have x be a matrix or a data frame, and it'll give you the correlation between all the columns. By default, it's going to try to use everything that it can, and it'll give you the Pearson correlation coefficient. But if you want to switch those defaults, you can plug in one of these other ones. So if we want to look at the correlation from the bus data set that we're using, so we can first just read it in using this uh, read circulator. If we just look at this table again, we see that we have the number of boardings, number of average boardings uh, for different colored buses. So maybe we want to know um, how what's the correlation between different colored buses for that number of rides. So we can use the correlation between the two. Uh, so here we're going to take orange and purple. So first we can just get the uh, columns as numeric vectors by using pull on the column from the data frame. So here x, we're going to have the average for orange and y, the average for purple. But if we just try to run this right away, we're going to get a problem that, well, it's going to give us NA back which is because there's some NAs in the orange and purple uh, vectors. So what you have to do is you have to tell uh, R to basically only use the rows, which neither purple nor orange has an NA. Because if you have uh, an NA in one of them and then not at the other, it still won't let you use that in the correlation uh, calculation since you're looking at pairs of numbers. So you have to say use and then complete observations uh, spelled like this. So this is only going to take the rows from x and y that both of them have a number. And then you'll get an output. So in this case, it looks like they're pretty highly correlated. And then um, a lot of times what you want to do is you'll want to see a scatter plot of the two variables you're comparing. And then you could just put the correlation straight onto the plot. So this is something maybe for like a submission to like a manuscript or something that you're going to want to uh, include a figure like this. So what you could use to do this is the annotate um, function. So first, we're just going to get the correlation like we did on the previous slide. So we're using core on x and y. And so that's just the number like 0 0.918 or whatever it was. And now we can change this into a character so we can put it onto the plot. So we're going to we're going to paste uh, r equals with, um, so round core val 3. This is basically saying just give me three digits instead of the whole huge uh, number we had on the previous slide. So this command is going to give us r equals 0 0.92 as a character. So now we can just do a ggplot like we did yesterday to make this scatter plot. So we have the x-axis, the orange average reds, y is purple. And then geom point give us the points. So that gives us the base layer. And now we want to put this text on top. So we're going to use this annotate function. So we're saying annotate, and then it's text we're doing. So we say text. And then you give it the position. So we say 2000 and 
7,500. And then the label is coming from our value here. And size is just to make it a little bit bigger. So that's uh, one way, I guess, you can paste a, uh, well, in this case, it's a character right on top of your plot to, uh, to just show you, I guess, because you can see visually that there is some relationship between these points. I mean, these two variables, if you just look at the plot, but you might not know how strong it is unless you include a number like this correlation. And uh, a lot of times you'll want to do correlation for a lot of variables at once instead of just two. And what we call that is the correlation matrix. So people a lot of times will just say compute the correlation matrix. And uh, one thing you got to note is everything in the data frame or matrix you're using has to be numeric. So here we're going to take the bus data and only take the uh, ones that add the end in uh, average. So now we have, instead of just green and purple, we're going to include orange and banner. Um, and if we just look at the dimensions of this new subset of uh, data frame, we see that there's uh, 1,146 rows and four columns. So those are the four colors. And then the rows are. I think like days or weeks or something. And then um, we can just, so we can run correlation, the uh, COR command straight onto this data frame. And since we're doing a data frame in the first uh, um, argument, we don't have to worry about any Y. So this could, you could say like X equals, and then uh, you don't have to worry about Y. Uh, but since we have NAs, we have to use the use complete again. So the result we get is this, four by four matrix. Um, so whatever dimension, the number of columns you have, that's gonna be the a square matrix of that form is what your output is. So you can see we've got orange, purple, green, banner, and then same thing going down. So the diagonal on here is always gonna be one because it's gonna be a thing with itself. And then the numbers are gonna be replicated on the top and bottom because it's symmetric. Um, but if you took a if you take us to this class, you'll learn all this stuff there. So uh, we don't have to worry about it right now. But a lot of times you might also want to just like visually see it uh, a little bit more easy than just looking at a bunch of numbers. So to do that, you can make a plot that has colors based on your correlation. So here we're going to use the uh, core plot uh, package, and then we're going to say core plot, and then our matrix we just made. And then if we want to sense the top and bottom of the matrix, I mean, it's symmetric along the diagonal. We don't have to worry about showing all the ones on the bottom since these are all the exact same as the ones up here. So we can just say upper. And then order just has to do with what order the variables come in. So if you only have four, it doesn't matter too much. You don't have to worry about that. But you can see in this plot, the darker blue means it's a higher correlation. And then darker red means it's a stronger negative correlation, but none of them are negatively correlated. So that's why I don't see any red show up. But like in some cases, you know, you might have, when you have more variables, you might have some that are, some that are zero or some that are negative correlation. So if you just see a plot like this, you can more quickly tell like, okay, so purple and orange have a strong correlation, but green and banner, it's, it's kind of weak. Um, but if you have, if you're just looking at a ton of numbers, like it could be a little bit difficult. Um, I think that's all for this one. Oh, I guess it's a uh, time for the lab. Okay. So now we're getting into t tests. So. If you're doing a t-test, there's two ways that they're used most frequently. So one way would be if you just have one variable and you think its mean is equal to something, then you can test whether it is or not. And you have a bunch of observations of that variable. And if you have to, if you want to test two variables to see if their means are equal or if the difference is equal to something, uh, then you can run a two-sample t-test on those. Um, and if the groups have people that are paired somehow. So you could either have uh, the same person in both groups, or maybe if you have like twins or something, then you could have a paired t-test. 
Um, so that's a little different than the one we're going to be covering, but you can still use this t-test function. Um, so the way you do t-test in R is the function is t period test. And you can see the arguments here. So x would be one of your vectors of data. And then if it's a two sample one, you could have a y vector. And so the default would be it's two-sided alternative, which is something uh, you could cover in a statistics class. And then the conversion will be 0 0.95. And the default would be that the mean or the difference in means is zero and that it's not a paired test. So um, getting into this, yeah, so the mu equals zero part is just saying that you think the mean of the variable is zero. So the test is just checking to see whether that seems to be true or not. And if you're using two-sided alternative, that's like saying that if the mean of the variable is too far from zero, either positive or negative, then you're going to say, actually, I don't think the mean of the variable is zero because the data looks like it actually could be, you know, the mean is too small or too big compared to zero. Uh, another way it could be one-sided, which would be saying like, I think the mean of the variable is zero or less. So only if the data show uh, it's much higher than that, that I'll say that this test is coming back different than what I expected. And um, this conference level 0.95 basically is saying how, how different from zero does the data have to be in order for us to say, we think the data are showing this variable's mean is not zero. Um, so you can change that, but a lot of people like to use 0 0.95. So we can use the bus data again. So we're going to just take the average ridership for the orange bus and get that into a numeric vector. Maybe we just run the t-test function on this vector. We can see this is what the output is. So we get a t-statistic and then degrees of freedom. Uh, but what most people want to see is this p-value. So we can see the p-value is really small. And what this is telling us is that the mean of the average number of rides on orange is probably not at zero. And so this t-test also gives us conference interval, 95% conference interval. So we see the mean rides on orange is probably somewhere in this range or around there. And so clearly this is not close to zero. So it kind of matches up with what we're thinking for the p-value. And we could see the sample mean was 3,000 something. So that's a lot bigger than zero. So now let's say we want to do a two sample t-test. So in this case, we might want to see our, the number of rides people take on orange and purple the same. And we don't necessarily care what that average is, just whether they are the same. So if we think that they're the same, we can say the difference is zero by saying mu equals zero in the function. And again, the default is going to be two-sided. So if orange is much, if there's many more people writing orange or many fewer people writing orange, that's going to be interesting to us. So we want to know that. And we're going to still use 95% conference level. And so by default, we'll say the data are not paired because you know these people writing orange and purple might not be related in any way. So we're just going to say they're not paired. And also we're going to assume the variance in the two groups is different, or yeah, is different, uh, which is the standard assumption. So here we're going to first get orange into X like we had before, and then Y we're going to pull into, or we're going to get the average of purple from the bus data in Y. And then to run the t-test, all you have to do is say t.test and then the two numeric vectors x and y. So now the output is pretty similar to what we just had on the previous page, but um, a few differences. So you see we still have a t-statistic and degrees of freedom and a p-value. And now we have a 95% conference rule. But this, so this conference rule is for the difference in means. So previously it was for just one of the means, and now it's for the difference in means. And we can see it looks like it's pretty large negative. So it's around like negative 900 or negative 1,000, which means that a lot more people are writing uh, purple than they are orange. And then so it also returns the mean of x and y. So this is the mean of the orange average, and this is the mean of the purple average. So you can see 
purple is around almost a thousand higher than orange. Uh, so when you run the t-test, the way that R returns the data is uh, in a list, which is not always the easiest thing to use. So we're going to go through how you can actually get the information from R uh, and use it in a nice way. So first, we're just going to store the result of the t-test here in this variable called result. And then we want to see, is it a list? And so we run, is that list on result? And that's true, because it is a list. So we want to look at what stuff is stored in result. So what stuff do does R have saved now? So we can see statistic, parameter, p-value, confidence interval, estimate. So these, these things are all from the previous, uh, when we showed the summary of the test, these things are all showing up in a summary. So now we can access it. Uh, instead of looking at the screen and then typing out the numbers, we can just uh, type out code to do it in a more like formal way, I guess. So we want the t-statistic, we can just say result. And then to access the list element, you say dollar sign, and then you can say statistic. So that gives us the t-statistic. If we want the p-value, we can do result and then dollar sign p-value. Um, but not always do you want to use dollar signs because you know that's base R and you might not want to do that. So you could use this broom package, which is uh, in the tidy universe. So this will make it into a nice data frame that you can easily manipulate and print. So you just load in Broom. So we still have result the same as before, but now we want to run tidies on the result. So just the function tidy. And then we want to look at what does that print out. So what result tidy gives us is a tibble that has all the same things that we had from the uh, the result list, but now it's in a table instead of a list. So we've got estimate, and then these two estimates are the means, and we've got the statistic, the value parameter, and then comments levels, and a few other things. But it's just a little bit easier to work with tables, especially to print them. So that's why you might want to put it into a tidy object instead of having it as a list. And then there's some other tests uh, besides just t-tests, but uh, we won't go into details for these ones, just so that you know they exist. Or like, maybe if you're doing a project and you your professor asks you to use some type of test, you can come look at this uh, page and see what the name was. So we got Wilcox test for the sign break test, and then Shapiro test, KS test for Komodo's Smirnoff one, Brains test for Fisher's F test, and then chi square test for the chi square test. Uh, so this is just a nice little list of some commonly used ones. Uh, but we're not going not gonna to go into any more details about this. All right, so now we're getting into regression, which is the real moneymaker of statistics. So we can start off with linear regression, which is um, you're trying to fit a data, like a data set with a line, basically. So you'll have one response variable, which you can consider y, and then one or more explanatory variables like x. So for maybe just an example, you could have y be uh, the income of somebody, and x could be maybe their age. So you might think maybe older people have more income on average, so you might try to fit a line to that data or something. So just to show, here's like a little formula you can think about when you're using linear regression. So yi is talking about the outcome for a specific person. That's what the little i indicates. And then so alpha is shared between all people, and that's the intercept of the line. And beta is also shared between everybody. So that's the slope of the line that you're fitting. And then xi is that person's specific uh, explanatory variable. So that's different between people. And then epsilon i is like basically because your line can't uh, go through everyone's point exactly. There's going to be a little bit of error every time. So epsilon i is like the little bit of error associated with each person because you couldn't perfectly fit a line. Um, so if this formula doesn't exactly make sense, maybe a plot will make it a little easier. So here, if we have y is people's income and x is their ages, you can plot everybody, you know, as we did yesterday 
uh, using ggplot, we get a little scatter plot. And now we can put this black line on here. This is uh, what we call the best fitting line. And we won't go into detail what that exactly means, but you can just see that the line does a pretty good job of getting close to everybody um, and tries to get, it, try, it does the best job it can, although it can't like perfectly uh, go through everyone's points. So we see alpha here is just the place where the line intersects the y-axis. So where x equals zero, then that alpha is the distance from y equals zero, I mean, the x-axis down to this point. Um, and then beta, so that's the slope of the line. So that's kind of this little triangle thing. Uh, if you remember from a long time ago, that's like rise over run. And then, so for like a person, if we just choose this person right here, this little point, so their xi is like three and their yi is like 1.1. And you can see the line doesn't do a perfect job of going through them. So there's a little bit of error between what we would predict and what they actually have happen. So this little red bar is the epsilon i from the previous formula. So that's like the little residual that we couldn't quite perfectly match up with this person. So you can also do it with multiple x's. So the way we just showed, that's only one x. But if you think about it, maybe you think you could predict that person's income with age and also maybe the number of kids they have or something like that. So that could be another x um, that you would want to put into your formula. And it might do a better job predicting. So every time you add a new explanatory variable in, you will probably want a new slope associated with that one. So you can see if we add in two more, so we have x2 and x3, then we're going to have beta 2 and beta 3. So those are new slopes associated with each of those explanatory variables. And uh, the i's just are indicating that each person has their own like x value for those things too. Uh, but you see like alpha still stays the same, epsilon i stays the same. So we just have two new slopes if we add in two new uh, variable or regressors essentially is what they're called. So uh, to do this in R, we use the LM function. So the things that a lot of times we'll just use defaults for most of these arguments, but the ones that you actually want to do something with is formula and data. So formula is where you're telling R like, this is what I think the outcome is and here's the things that are going to predict the outcome. And then data is just saying, this is where you're going to take all the data from. And then that's where, what you're going to use to run the analysis. So to see it with some actual example. OK, so from before, we have yi equals alpha plus beta xi plus epsilon i. So the way you tell R that this is what you want is you just say y tilde x. So basically, R automatically fills in the blanks that you don't put in. So it knows you want an intercept, and it knows there's going to be some error. So all you have to say is y is the one on the left side of the equation, and x is the one that has a slope associated with it. So if you're actually running it on uh, something that you actually have real data for, you just replace y and x with the names of the columns from your data set. So in this case, if we have income as the outcome, and we want years of education to be the predictor, we'd have income tilde years of education. And what that would look like in a formula is income would be yi, years of education would be xi, and then so you'll have a slope and intercept and error term. And if you have multiple uh, explanatory variables, the way you put it in for r is you say y tilde, and then the first one plus the second one plus the third one. So this is just translating exactly to the line above. So you have the intercept still, and then a slope for each of those three x's, and then uh, epsilon i. So like R basically assumes that those other terms that you don't type in here are going to be there. And um, so when you run like LM and R, what it's trying to do is figure out what's the best alpha and the best betas. Um, so we'll see that in a second. but. That's what it's basically doing. And if you're going to do this with actual data, so let's say we had years of education, age, and location for our predictors, then we'll have income tilde 
and then just the names of the columns with plus signs in between them. So years of education plus age plus location. So we could run this on some data from Kaggle. So this one is something to do with car options. So the, we can just read it in and then look at what it looks like. So we have uh, this whole table and the ones we want to look at are, so vehicle age, you see these are numbers. This is the years old the vehicle is. And then vehicle odo, so this is the vehicle odometer saying how many miles the vehicle has. So you might think, okay, I think that the older a car is, the more miles it probably has because people drive it. So I'm going to try to predict the uh, number of miles the odometer has based on the age. And if you think it's a linear relationship, you can you know do linear regression like we're doing here. So let's do LM because that's the way you do linear regression in R. And then, so because odometer is the outcome, we put on the left side of the tilde, and then we do tilde vehicle age. And the data is coming from cars, so we say data equals cars. And we can save this into fit. And if we just print fit, this is what we get. We see it'll tell us exactly what we ran. And then it'll tell us some things called coefficients. So what coefficients means is this number, this 6,000 or 60,127, is the alpha from our um, formula before, which means this is the intercept. So uh, if you basically plugged in zero for age, then this is what you would expect for the odometer. Um, and then this is the slope term. So this is saying for each increase in age by one year, this is how many more miles you expect to have. So this is beta from before um, in our formula. So these are just the best fitting. So this, what LM is doing is basically finding what's the best alpha and beta, which are these two numbers, to fit the data with a straight line. So this is what it returns is the best alpha and beta. And if you want to see some more details, you can hit summary on your fit. So we type in S fit to be the summary of the fit, and we print it out. And now we see it gives us a little bit more information. So. Uh, the really good stuff is right here in the coefficients section. So you see it gives us those estimates that we had from before, but it also gives us standard errors. So if you wanted to complete like a confidence interval, you could use these. And it tells you some p-values. So if you want to say whether uh, a slope is not zero, you know, you can use these. And some other things people like are adjusted R squared to see how good of a fit it is. And sometimes maybe you could even look at the F statistic, but we're not going to talk about that. Okay, so then if you want to take the data and use it uh, from the fit in a nice way, like we did before, we're going to use tidy um, because it's a little bit hard to manipulate straight from the fit. So we can just take tidy on the stored fit uh, object. And we get this two by five table, which has the different so the intercept and then the estimate of the intercept and the p-value and everything. And then the number of uh, x or predictor variables you put in is going to be the number uh, of extra rows besides the intercept. So we have just one here for the vehicle age. And we get the estimate as before. And then these other columns, which have uh, interesting information. That So if you wanted to print something out, you could put it in a table first. Or if you want to manipulate it um, somehow in another way, you might want to put in a table uh, before you start to do your further calculations. And oh yeah, so this is just showing if you wanted to not put in a table for some reason, that the way it comes out originally is a list. So you can see here's the names of everything that's in the fit. Um, so a lot of these you might not care about, but something like if you do want to get the R squared, you could just do a dollar sign and then do R squared. Um, I guess you can see the table doesn't have, when you run tidy, you don't get all of those same things. So something like R squared or just R squared, you might have to actually use the list object and access it using this. So that's just something to keep in mind if you're going to be doing um, some analysis of your results. OK, so now if we want to get multiple predictors in our model, so we want to say vehicle age and warranty cost, and we want to fit the best line using both of those predictors. We can just add 
warranty cost into the formula here with a plus sign and then warranty cost. So now we're fitting the best line that uses vehicle age and warranty cost as predictors. And if you hear someone say like controlled for, so you could say like, oh, this is like we're controlling for warranty cost here by adding it in as another predictor. So that's something people like to say a lot. And uh, when they talk about, I don't know, epidemiology or something. Okay, so now when you see this, we get another row in our fit, um, which is corresponding to warranty cost. So this estimate here is the slope associated with warranty cost. And you can see actually the intercept and the vehicle age slopes also changed a little bit, um, just because when you add in a new variable, it's gonna change, it's gonna change everything a little bit. And so we get different values for just our squared and everything. Yeah, so that's, there's not too much different about when you add in new variables, all you say is plus and then the new variable name. And you'll just get extra rows um, corresponding to that new variable. And one thing to note is if you're using a factor as uh, something in your regression, it's going to be a little different than um, any other type of uh, variable. So some previously, some people were asking, like, why would you ever use factors if you could just use characters? And one reason is that you might want to use a regression where you put it in as a factor. Because when you put it in as a factor, you can order it, or you can say, like, this is the baseline level. And then when you do the regression, all of the results will be in comparison to the baseline. So for using the data we have here, we have a variable called top three American name. And uh, so we're just going to take that from the data frame and save it here in top three. And now we just want to look at what does top three look like. So it has five options. So it has Chrysler, Ford, GM, Null, and other. So most of the values are in these three. Well, I, I guess other actually has a lot too, but then there's a few in Null. So um, top three is a factor, and it's ordering based on I think just based on alphabetical order. So Chrysler is going to be considered the baseline. So if we run a linear regression where we have um, the odometer being predicted based on the factor top three American name, and you run this, so you can see what you get in the output. Instead of just having one row associated with it, because this is not a numeric vector, a value, it's a factor, you're going to have uh, the number of factors minus one show up in your outcome table. And basically the baseline one, in this case it was Chrysler just because alphabetically it was first, is going to be considered the intercept. So if you think like, what, what exactly does this mean? This estimate is saying that the average odometer for Chrysler is 68,000 miles. And then what does this for 8,000 mean? This is saying, on average, Fords have 8,000 more miles than Chrysler's. So everything that has the word factor first is basically in comparison to the baseline. And the baseline is the one that doesn't show up, which is Chrysler. So all of these ones besides null have more miles on average than Chrysler. And you can see you still get all the other types of things you want, like standard errors, t values, and uh, p values. And of course, this outcome stuff here. So adjust our squared. Um, but yeah, so basically just keep in mind, if you run something with a factor, the baseline is going to sh not show up, and all the other levels will show up. And they're all in comparison to the baseline. But the baseline is like incorporated into the intercept. So just if you get confused about something, just try to remember that. And so if you run a tidy on this, we'll just, it'll basically just take out the next part of that outcomes table. So you have intercept and then four of the factor levels. And so this is the same as before. Okay, so now getting into some more complicated stuff. So generalized linear models, or like people call them GLMs, is basically for fitting stuff that you can't fit with LM. And then, I mean, you can't fit everything with JLMs either, but this is just for fitting some other things. So 
something that we didn't talk about is really for linear models, you should only be fitting things that are approximately normal. Um, so something like uh, an outcome that has only a zero or a one, you definitely should not be fitting a linear model with. Um, so maybe if you want to look at how does uh, hospitalization affect COVID, so like maybe death or discharge or the outcomes, you would want to use something like logistic regression because the outcome is a zero or a one. And it doesn't make sense to try to fit a linear model to that. And then Poisson regression is kind of a similar idea. So if there's like, maybe you want to see uh, how many touchdowns does a team score during a football game, uh, because there's only certain numbers that could exist, like you can't have like 1.1 or something, then you probably wouldn't want to fit a linear model. So Poisson model would make more sense. Um, but those, those type of things would be covered in a statistics class. So you'll know which model to use based on that. And we're just going to try to show you how to run these other ones. Oh, so it's pretty similar to LM in terms of what the arguments are. There's only one extra thing we have to do, which is we have to tell it which type of GLM to run. Because since there's a lot of them, we just say, OK, it's so basically this is the one we want to run. And the way you do that is using this family argument. And uh, a lot of times, the default of the link will be fine, so you don't have to necessarily say it. So for example, with logistic regression, your family argument should be binomial, and then link equals legit. And then for Poisson regression, it should be Poisson link equals log. But there's other ones, too. So um, if you ever want to use some other ones, you could just do question mark family to pull up the help page for family, and you can see what the other options are. So in the data we have, there's a column called is bad buy, which is just a one or a zero saying whether the vehicle you bought was a bad buy. Um, so let's say we want to try to figure out some stuff about that. So because it's a one or zero, we want to do a logistic regression. So we're going to have to do GLM as our function. And the way you put in the models is the exact same as the linear models. So you just say whatever the outcome is, so is bad buy tilde. And then your predictors here. So let's do odometer and age, because maybe we think higher odometer and higher age are going to be more likely that the vehicle was a bad buy. And so you just tell it the data you're using. So here's the part that is uh, special, I guess, about GLMs is you have to say family equals. And because we're doing logistic regression, so the outcome is a zero one, we want to say binomial. And we don't have to worry about the link part because the default is already good enough. So then we can just look at the summary and we see we have really similar stuff as before. We have these coefficients with the estimate, standard error, p values. And um, so the way you interpret the coefficients will be a little different because of the way the model runs. Um, but that, of course, would also be covered in a statistics class. And so you see that this part is also a little different than linear models, um, just based on the way that GLMs fit. But this stuff would be useful if you want to see if the model is a good fit or not. Um, of course, you know you might have to take another class to try to um, understand exactly what's happening here. But um, so that is the general way of doing GLMs. So obviously, we didn't go into details about that. So it's basically it's up to you to make sure to understand what the methods are you, that you're trying to use before you do it to make sure that the results are accurate. I mean, they make sense and they are accurate. Um, because if you just start running a bunch of models on data that you have, but you don't know if the assumptions are true, that could give you some misleading results. And um, I guess also it's up to you to know the R software well enough to trust what you're doing, basically. Um, cause you don't want to publish paper and then, you know, get in trouble from having some problems. So, um, basically we're just trying to help you with running the software, but you just got to double check that what you're doing is, is okay. Okay. Lab three.